Everybody, thank you for coming along tonight. Um, I appreciate it's time out of your day, but it's really important to us to kind of get your feedback on where the study's progressing. Um, we'll run through what's going to be coming up, but a part of it's going to be looking at some mitigation options we've assessed. So, kind of getting your feedback on how appropriate you think they are. If there's any others you'd like us to look at, well, that's some really important feedback that we'd really appreciate. So I'll run through a quick summary of the project, a um, couple of new faces, just a bit of background on what the study is, why we're doing it, and who the players are. Uh, the key things we're running through tonight are the results of the, the mail out survey that we sent, um, where we asked for your input on a number of factors in the study. Um, so we'll be running through typical responses um, and kind of what we've been able to learn from the feedback we received. And the other major thing is the flood management options, of which there's a poster at the back you might have had a look, but we'll run through each of those individually um, to have a bit of a better look in more detail at what they are and the effect that they have on the flooding. Uh, then we'll just quickly touch on what's coming next, and then we'll have a bit of a question and answer discussion at the end. It's just a figure of the study team. Um, Child Haven City Council commissioned this study and they've engaged Cardinal um, and I'm employed through Cardinal to undertake the flooding assessments. The Office of Environment and Heritage uh, assists Council um, through providing funding but also through a peer review um, of what we provide to Council to make sure that everything's up to speed and done appropriately. Uh, and then the major stakeholder uh, is the community and other agencies involved in the area. Um, and this workshop is a way for us to get feedback from you on what we're looking at uh, and any other things that you'd like us to assess as part of the process. The floodplain risk management process moves through a number of phases. Uh, and this particular study um, is moving towards the end of this cycle, which is the preparation of the floodplain risk management study and plan. Um, so prior to this study, and we had a, look at, a bit of a look at this as well, is the flood study, which defines the existing flooding behaviour of the Lake Tabari region. Uh, the primary focus of this study is to look at flood mitigation options to reduce the flood damages and flooding risks um, that the township experiences. Uh, and from that, we'll develop the risk management plan, which we'll provide to council, which will allow them to prioritise flooding works that can be implemented within the catchment. quick snapshot of the <coughs> study area. We have looked at the entire catchment area, but the study is really focusing on the township. Uh, it's where the greatest flood risks are, it's where the people are, and it's also where the infrastructure is that will experience damages during a flooding event. So the focus has really been from the Princess Highway Bridge, and then down through the township, around to the caravan park, and to the entrance. And then we've also moved up some of the Tributaries that feed into Tabari Creek, um, but also result in flooding of access roads or properties. This is the second community workshop we've held. The first was back in October. That workshop was focused on an introduction to the study, kind of setting the scene for what was going to be coming next. Uh, had a bit of a discussion around the existing flooding, um, and I got those slides into this presentation just so you're aware if you wanted to run through any of that again. And then a bit of a discussion around the mitigation options that were available. Um, so we haven't looked at any of the options yet, it was just kind of brainstorming what could be possible. Uh, and then a bit of a discussion at the end there about what the community's concerns were, what kind of flooding issues that they had experienced that they would like us to take a look at to see if we could mitigate. There's two broad stages of the community consultation. Uh, stage one, kind of following the consultations throughout the study. And then stage two will be a, the third workshop, which we'll hold, well, we will hold during the public exhibition of the documents that we prepare. Uh, the first stage of the community consultation was the mail out, which was a brochure and a survey that we sent to all the residents, uh, 
for property owners within the township um, to ask for their feedback on historical flooding that they've witnessed, um, what kind of options or scenarios they would like to see put in place to help mitigate future flooding. Um, so this survey was sent out to about 420 property owners um, and 200 of those were in the, the PMF or the, the probable maximum flood extent. Um, so these are the properties that if the worst possible flood occurred, they would experience some kind of flooding. Um, of those surveys, we got 144 back, which was a return rate of 34%, which is very large. Um, we typically get returns for these type of surveys in the order of 10%. Um, so it's three and a half times larger than what we'd normally see, which, which was fantastic. Um, horribly due in part to a large proportion of long-term owners who'd experienced flooding whilst they've been here, um, has something to offer and would like to see things put in place. Nearly 70% of people have been here for more than 10 years um, and 35 for more than 20, which is a pretty high long-term. We asked people uh, two key questions as far as the flooding goes. One of them was what their previous experience of flooding was, and then what they perceived their future risk of flooding to be. Um, and as you might expect, the expectations tally very closely to people's experiences of previous flooding. Um, and that creates a bit of a risk in the catchment because there hasn't been a large flood event within the system for quite some time. Um, so what we're looking at here, the blue shows what people expect their flooding to be, and the red shows what would be, or what flooding they would experience in a large flood event. Um, so whilst only 2% of people expected to have overflow flooding, um, closer to 20% of those people would experience a flood over the floor of their buildings. Um, and again, you can see a much larger proportion didn't expect to be affected by flooding when in fact you know, their properties or their houses would be. Um, and this is kind of important for us to know um, in planning some of the emergency response measures. And it suggests that um, a bit more community engagement or some information transfer from council to the community uh, would be of use to make sure that people appreciate the flood risk of attachment. We also asked people what kind of flood mitigation strategies they would like to see in place for the township. Um, by far the most popular was management of the entrance, um, followed closely by dredging of Tabari Lake and Tabari Creek. Um, people weren't so interested in uh, part engineering structural options like levee banks or retarding basins or works on pits and pipes. Um, much more popular were the management uh, channel improvements, which might be clearing out debris, um, clearing out invasive species and plant and natives um, so that those channels are better able to handle the flow. Um, you'll see when we have a look at the options we've assessed. Um, we have focused on the letter banks in particular, um, in part because there's only so much we can do to mitigate the flooding um, through the management of the entrance and the bridging of the lake. Um, just a flag and we'll explore that in a bit further detail. In the track. So the options we assess using the flood model that we developed for the township. Mm -hmm. um, the options are assessed um, through a triple bottom line approach, looking at their economic, environmental and social benefits um, to make sure that all of these factors are taken into account when assessing how feasible or how effective these options are. Broadly speaking, there are three categories of options that we look at. Uh, the first is structural options. There's also property modification and response modification options. These structural options are 
options that change the physical behaviour of the flood. Um, so they might be upgrades to the drainage system, levee banks, detention basins, uh, which change the way the floodwaters behave as they move through the township. The pictures at the bottom were just to demonstrate, they're all of levee banks. Um, the levees don't need to be very big, they don't need to be very visible, but they can be tied in um, to the surrounding landscape. Um, and still be very effective. Property modification options are options that look at what changes can be made to a property to make it more resistant to flooding. So it could be building them from flood resistant materials so that if the flood comes and the property gets wet, it's not going to experience significant damage. Um, it also includes planning controls that council has in place to guide and limit the development uh, to reduce the flood risk for those properties. And also house raising, an extreme example down the bottom, um, voluntary purchase or other options around how we can change the properties to make them more resilient to, to flooding when it occurs. And the final set of options we look at are emergency response modifications um, or options and these are options that look at how the community responds during a flood event. Um, so as we were talking before about the difference between the actual flood risk and the perceived flood risk, um, that's a good example of this emergency response is educating people on what their flood risk is so that they're in a better position to respond appropriately to you in a flood event. Um, also includes flood warning systems, uh, the transfer of the information and the data that we develop to the SES to help them plan their response during flood events. Um, awareness campaigns and, and flood warning sites. We're going to run through uh, the structural options that we've assessed um, using our flood model. Um, there's a, a range of ones that we have a look at. Um, so levees, road raising, some vegetation management, that's uh, up a few of the creeks. Uh, dredging in a couple of different locations as well as entrance management. You'll notice that as we go through you'll see that the options that we implement don't really have a very wide impact on the wider flood behaviour. And it's largely due to the fact that the works that we're putting in place are on the fringes of the flood. Um, so it's not really, they don't affect the main flow. Um, so there's not really a, a large amount of flow on. Well, sorry, that's a pretty bad one. Um, kind of upstream or downstream impacts. Like the, so when we implement a levee bank, we're not seeing any wide impacts to the rest of the floodplain. That's they're very localised changes. This is all. This is just a quick snapshot of what the different flood levels are within the township for various events. Um, with the key thing being that from the the twenty percent annual exceedance probability, which is a 20% chance of a flood of this magnitude occurring in, in any one year, um, up to a 1% annual exceedance probability, so a 1% chance of that flood occurring. There's not a great deal of difference. Um, so the levee banks that we've looked at are in the order of a 5% to a 2% level. Um, they have been quite successful, so we're going to take another look at them as to what the impacts might be if we lifted them up to provide additional protection. Um, oh, sorry. You'll also see though that the options that we implement aren't going to remove all of the flood risk. Um, so the probable maximum flood is substantially higher than the others. Um, so being aware of the flooding risks is still going to be important because we aren't going to be able to remove all of the flood risks for the township. The first levy we had a look at runs along the rear of the properties immediately downstream of the bridge, um, which back onto the Princess Highway. We put the levy at the 20% level, one of the lower levels, um, mainly because in events larger than this, there is flow over the Pacific Highway into these properties. Um, so there's a risk of them filling up um, 
can we put a levy around there um, that, was, that was too high. It's still a substantial height, it's 1.2 metres, um, but it does remove all of the flooding within that area um, in the smaller events. Um, the colour scale is the greens are improvement and the blues um, are adverse impacts. Um, so as I was saying, there's no... Despite the floodwaters moving this way, we're not seeing any backing up, um, any flood level increase upstream of the levee, largely because it's being constructed at the fringe of the flood. The majority of the flow is still moving without impediment um, down to the creek. Very similar, uh, a levee along the, the creek side of Portland Way. Um, we've been able to construct this one uh, to a higher event, uh, so the 1% annual extinguish probability. It doesn't have to be as high um, if the terrain is already a bit higher at that point, so it's of the order of a, a half a metre, um, which could be tied in um, quite nicely in that, that open space between the road and the creek. And again, it prevents any flooding of those properties or the roads um, during events of quite a significant flood. The Caravan Park is an area um, that we recognise as high risk, um, partly because the first thing to be inundated in a flood is the roadway, so they lose their access before they're aware that their site is flooding. And secondly, because there's chances of a large number of people who aren't familiar with the catchment um, being in there, who aren't going to know what the flooding risks are or how to respond appropriately. So one of the options that we looked at was raising the level of the access road um, so that the overtopping depths were 20 centimetres in the 1% event. Uh, and this is a limit for the the safe travel of vehicles. So up to that flood that allows people to drive out of the caravan park and not be trapped in there. Um, didn't have any impact on the flooding behaviour, again because it's out on the flood fringe. Um, but it is a good option for reducing the flooding risk for the caravan park. Similarly we looked at raising the level of the highway um, to prevent any overtopping flows coming from Brandory Creek over the highway um, into the properties downstream. Uh, and also provides access during a flood event. Uh, should be noted it's still limited access, that it'll allow you to move along this reach of road, um, but during a flood it's highly likely that road access further north and further south are going to be cut. So places to evacuate to are still going to be limited. It resulted in some increases upstream of the road raising. Um, because it was preventing as much water washing over, that water is now building up um, behind the raised roadway. Uh, it's not a particularly big change, uh, three centimetres. And where it does impact on properties, there might be options that we could look at to uh, a local levy, protect those properties from any of those flooding increases. We looked at a series of levy scenarios for Lemon Tree Creek uh, to protect the properties in that area that experience flooding when the creek bursts its banks. Uh, the area is quite low, it's quite flat, so when the creek gets too high it washes out uh, quite a large area. We've looked at levees up to around the 2% level. Um, but as you saw, there's not a great deal of difference between that and larger floods. So something that we're going to look at is if we can get away with potentially moving in a bit higher to provide additional protection. Um, for this scenario, it's about a 0.8 of a metre rise. Um, and you can see in this case, there are some upstream impacts as a result of the flow being retained upstream of the levee. Um, which is the, the light blue. Um, 
in the order of a couple of centimetres and it's not impacting any development, um, so that might be acceptable. <coughs> In the same area, I'm um, just protecting a different block of properties. Uh, so it's a levee along along the creek, as well as some local road raising to prevent any of that overland flow um, coming across through the houses and through the properties. Again, some upstream impacts, and these ones do impact properties to the west, as you can see, uh, which might mean that if this is an option that we look at implementing, it's going to need to include the previous levy scenario to provide protection to those properties on the west. And again, this is the same area, but now we're out at where the two creeks meet. Um, so this would require a levy or a flood wall around the perimeter of the houses along the creek edge to prevent any flows coming in from the creek, um, as well as some local road raising to prevent any flows backwatering around from further upstream. Um, the road raising isn't too significant, uh, 60 centimetres, um, but the levee height is a bit more substantial. Um, and again, it has some impacts on the flow um, kind of upstream along to Bowery Creek, but again, they're relatively minor, um, just a centimetre or two. And there might be things that we could look at to mitigate those impacts. Vegetation management is a broad term that kind of covers a range of options that improve the ability of that creek to convey flow. Um, so it could be removing any fallen trees or large pieces of debris. Um, if there's any build up of rubbish or foreign invasive species on the banks, um, we could look at taking them out and replanting them. Um, however, it's not having a great benefit. It's not reducing any of the upstream levels, but the ease of water travel down the creek now results in increases downstream. Um, so from a reduction of flood damages or flood risk point of view, it's not really a successful option. Um, you're not going to get much benefit from putting this one in place. Dredging of Saltwater Creek did result in flood level reductions upstream, uh, but they're not benefiting any properties, uh, it's just in open space. Um, by the time it actually reaches uh, where residential development has occurred, uh, there's no change uh, in, the, in the peak flood levels there. And similarly, by allowing water to flow more freely down that creek, there's some minor impacts downstream. Uh, so again, it's an option that's not really going to realise any benefit in terms of flood damages. We look at dredging in a couple of locations. One of them was immediately upstream of the entrance. Um, when we had a look at the information that we had, there was a substantial layer of sediment immediately upstream of the entrance um, before it dropped down to the creek level. And a second location was up uh, towards the bridge, downstream of the lake. Um, again, there was quite a lot of sediment in that region. Um, and there have been some suggestions that taking it out might help to improve flooding conditions. From our assessment, we didn't see any change in the flooding. Um, there was a slight change to the way the entrance opened. Um, so by the end of the flood, the entrance was a little bit wider, a little bit deeper, as a result of removing that material immediately upstream of it. But it didn't translate into any reduction in peak flood levels. Um, so again, from a flood damages point of view, from a flood risk point of view, um, the dredging of Tabari Creek isn't really going to realise any benefits. We also had a look at an open entrance scenario, so permanently opening the lake entrance um, to see what that would do. There was a brief discussion at 
the first workshop around the different flooding mechanisms that the township experiences, um, with one being from catchment flows, the flow from the upstream catchment and through the creeks, and the second being an ocean driven flood event where the flood comes in from the ocean and backs up the creeks. So you can see that opening the entrance, this yellow line, is a benefit for those catchment driven events. So when the ocean is low and the entrance is open, those catchment events are allowed to wash out to sea much more effectively. But it doesn't have any impact on those ocean driven events. Um, the water still just comes in and still just backs up. Um, so on an overall picture of a reduction in the flooding risks doesn't really give you very much benefit. Um, you're still going to be at risk from those ocean driven flood events. Um, yeah, this is what we found from having a look at that option. It's also worth noting that the levy options will also provide some assistance to the low level persistent flooding where the levels just creep up and up and up and up when the entrance is closed. They might also give you some flexibility in looking at alternative trigger levels for when the entrance might be opened. That by putting the levers in place, you might allow the creek to build up higher before you artificially open the entrance. And it's also worth noting that, I'll just jump to the next slide. We'll come back to this one. Something else that we're having a look at are the impacts that are resulting from climate change. So the levees will help a little bit as the sea levels rise, um, but you can see that the 2050 and 2100 scenarios um, are substantially different to the base case, uh, which I suppose makes things a bit tricky in terms of implementing these options that if we put them in place to mitigate the existing flooding now, in 20 to 30 years, you may just have to do it again um, because the system has just risen that much higher. So as well as looking at lifting some of those options to higher existing levels, we'll also have a look at what would happen if we lifted them to say 2050 level, um, which would then provide flooding protection um, out to that time horizon. Just back to the previous slide. You can see with the shading that the central light blue, this one here, is the 20% or roughly the one in five year event um, under existing conditions. For 2050, which is the light blue, the new 20%, new one in five year event <coughs> is very similar to what your current flood percent, your current one in 100 year flood percent is, um, which suggests that due to climate change, when you get to 2050, your one in five year will be equivalent to what the one in 100 year is now. Um, so, making that futurist is something that we'll be doing a bit more assessment on to see if we can put in place options that are robust enough to remain in place um, under changing climate conditions. <coughs> From those options that we looked at, we undertake a benefit cost analysis, um, which allows us to have a look at how effective these options are in reducing the damages that the township experiences during the flood event. So our benefits are the, the reduction in flood damages that occur as a result of putting that option in place. And we look at this for a range of flood events from the, the small frequent ones to the, the larger, rarer ones. And we weigh that against uh, the costs, which are the initial construction costs as well as an ongoing maintenance cost. And benefit costs weigh these out. And what we want to see the benefit cost ratio column is something greater than one 
because this says that the benefits that we realise from that option are greater than the costs of implementing the option. And from the structural options that we looked at, the only one that did that was that last levy option, um, which protected that ring of properties at the confluence of Lemon Tree Creek and Zabari Creek. Uh, the Princess Highway levy ranked highly. Um, but a couple of the other ones, because they weren't delivering benefits in frequent flooding events um, over the long term, they were more expensive to build than they were, um, well, more expensive to build than the savings that they delivered in terms of flood damages. The economics is not the only thing that we look at. We also look at the social and the environmental benefits that arise from these options. And to do that, we undertake a multi-criteria assessment uh, where each of these options is awarded a score uh, for their you know, economic effectiveness, their social effectiveness, and their environmental effectiveness. And then all of those scores are added up to give an overall ranking as to how efficient and how effective that option is. So a good example of why we would undertake this assessment is the raising of the caravan park road. It's not going to prevent flood damages occurring on site, but it does reduce the flooding risk of the site by allowing people to safely evacuate during a flooding. Um, and it's those kind of things that this assessment picks up. Um, so we're in the process of undertaking this at the moment. Um, It'll be in the final report and something that we'll discuss uh, in the final workshop. So the next steps are completing this assessment of the mitigation options, having a look at raising some of those levies, having a look at how we can make these options more resilient um, to future conditions. Then undertaking that multi-criteria assessment, um, having a look at how these options may improve things socially or environmentally. From there, we'll prepare the, the study and the plan and provide them to council for review. Um, and at that time, we'll have a third workshop um, where we'll present the final findings um, and have discussion around the methodologies that we've used in the multi-criteria assessment to make sure that we're giving each of those things the weight um, that you think is appropriate. So thank you for listening quietly to all of that. Um, now I'd like to yeah, pass it back if there are any questions you might have.